So I think it's pretty clear now I have no distinct theme for my channel and the subjects I talk about. So we're going to talk about movies this time, if that's all right. So if we're going to talk about movie theaters dying off, then I need to make a confession. I'm part of the problem. I haven't seen a movie at the theater or paid for a ticket in almost five years now. It's not because I don't like movies. In fact, film has been an incredibly important part of my life. I've watched hundreds of them, studied them at college and university, and I even rate and track what I've seen on Letterboxd, although I haven't been keeping up with it very well lately. I haven't fallen out of love with movies. There are still some incredible and innovative films still being released, but when I look at what's playing on screens near where I live, I mostly just see back-to-back -back showings of blockbuster movies, which I'm not really interested in. I also have to admit that I just don't like the theatre experience anymore, and I kind of have to blame the audience for that. The last few times I went to watch a movie in a the theatre, there was trash all around, suspicious wet marks on armrests, people talking out loud, using their phones with the volume on, creating content for their socials, and there were parents who brought their very young children with them to watch an R-rated movie with some graphic violence. Even though I've seen movies at a theatre dozens of times throughout my life and had lots of amazing experiences, I think I'm finally over it. I don't know what I might be getting into by going to see a movie at the theatre, but I do know what I'll get at home. Cheaper snacks, a familiar couch, better hygiene, no annoying audience, a pause button, bathroom breaks, volume control, and if I need it, subtitles. I am perfectly fine watching a movie on our modestly sized living room TV with a modest soundbar if it means that I don't have to step into a theater again. And considering that the kinds of films that I enjoy now end up being put on streaming services directly because movie studios know that they won't bring in a billion dollars, I guess you can say that we sort of have an understanding with each other now. Now, I know that everything I just said has a lot of old man yells at cloud energy to it, but I I'm not alone, and since the advent of COVID-19, people like me are slowly becoming the majority. And as you can guess from the video title, that's partly why movie theaters are dying off. It's not just the annoyances of actually going to see a movie though, but we'll get into that as we go along. I'm sure that for many of you, this comes as a surprise. After all, many of the movies released in recent years have raked in over a billion dollars at the box office, an amount which any film studio would consider a resounding success. Some of these movies gain a lot of public attention too, where they're frequently discussed online. Memes and other content are made that are based on them, sensationalizing them enough that it convinces other people to go see a movie just so they don't miss out on something. There's also the fact that out of the 50 highest grossing movies ever made, 33 of them were released in the past 10 years alone, with every one of them bringing in over one to two billion dollars each. Clearly, money is being made. Tickets are being bought and people are still watching movies. So how is it that movie theaters are dying off around the world? Well, let's look at the theater going experience first. For starters, for most people, going to see a movie is not cheap. If you're a family of four, it can cost almost $100. And that's not even taking into account the cost of snacks, which if you've ever gone to see a movie with a kid, Good luck walking past the concession stand without hearing any complaints from them. Movie theater snacks, drinks, and popcorn are famously overpriced, especially popcorn, which has such a high profit margin that it's practically kept some theaters from closing completely. But when you factor all that into the equation, a trip to see a movie isn't exactly what most people would consider a cheap night out. Honestly though, just smuggle in your snacks. Get a satchel or a handbag, preferably one with a few discreet compartments, then stuff them in there. Maybe cover them with like a scarf or a t-shirt, whatever really. Theater attendants really don't get paid enough to care. You can also make something up like, oh, these are prescription Skittles. I have to taste the rainbow once every 12 hours. The average AMC movie ticket price in the US is around $12, higher than the global average of approximately $9.63 per ticket as of 2023. The US has always been one of the most important and lucrative markets for box office sales, boasting some of the highest attendance rates and financial returns worldwide, which, as you can probably surmise, is partly due to the high cost of seeing a movie here. 
Additionally, both China and India have higher overall theatre attendance, which is not surprising given their status as the two most populous countries in the world, coupled with their lower ticket prices compared to the US. These countries are significant markets for Hollywood, particularly China. However, the US has always been the most lucrative market, making the recent decline in attendance particularly impactful. The movie theater experience is also something that many people are finding harder to tolerate. As I mentioned near the start, the viewing experience can be hindered by things such as technical issues with the theater or audience members who have little respect for other people's enjoyment and comfort. You don't have to look far on YouTube or TikTok to find clips of people getting into arguments or even full-blown fights in movie theaters, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. For people who just want to sit down and enjoy the full cinema experience without distractions, it's enough to convince them not to return. At least, that's how I feel. Other than the actual theatre-going experience, which is starting to feel like an expensive gamble, there's also the problem of variety. The movie industry, especially major studios, have become increasingly reliant on a narrow selection of genres, and each of them require astonishingly high budgets to produce. The exception to this is horror movies, which in general are considered a safe bet since they're fairly inexpensive to produce compared to a blockbuster movie, and they're popular among teens, young adults, etc. They're mostly profitable. Other than horror, the genres you'll most commonly find showing in theatres these days are blockbuster superhero or franchise films with $200 million budgets, sequels, reboots and remakes of well-established IPs, adaptations from other media properties, spin-offs, and CG animated movies. All of these categories can best be described as a safe bet. You know what to expect from a superhero movie. Blockbusters all have a similar template to each other and are accompanied with gigantic marketing budgets. Sequels, reboots, and remakes are obviously recognizable since they have a legacy, and CG animated movies have a broad generational appeal, especially to children. All of these genres have sort of been engineered to fill the audience's needs and wants from a movie, and in turn have created the conditions in which studios feel less of a need to produce films with a singular genre focus. To clarify, let me ask you, when was the last time that you saw a movie released in theaters nationwide that was just a straight up comedy or even romantic comedy? It's been a good while, right? You'll see them on streaming services like Netflix, and I'll get to the reasons behind that in a bit, but compared to the past, you barely ever see them in theaters, and that's because they're almost never billion dollar earners. They can do well, but not well enough to be shown in theaters, to be put on screens. You see, movie studios have sort of taken the P.T. Barnum approach to entertainment now, where they want movies to have a little bit of everything for everyone. They release these large budget movies with the expectation of them bringing in at least a billion dollars, and they include all aspects that an audience could ask for. Take Marvel movies, for example. If you want drama, there's drama. If you want comedy, there's jokes. If you want action, there's lots of it. If you want romance, there's love interests. Something for everyone. But in general, there's not enough of one thing to satisfy a specific taste. Unless it's action, since every single one of these movies seems to end with 45 uninterrupted minutes of horribly edited VFX-filled panic attacks. Now, I'm not going to say that people don't want these types of films, because that would be categorically wrong. If we look again at those top 50 highest grossing movies, you'll see that most of them are franchise movies, sequels, adaptations, and so on. It's not necessarily a recent discovery, because even in the 80s and 90s, they found that sequels were popular, but new IPs with a theatrical release are rarer than they've ever been now compared to then. The movie industry has figured out that, in general, it's better to play it safe with the kind of films it produces, and that means catering, or arguably pandering, to people's feelings of familiarity and nostalgia. Part of this is because they're ideas that are easy to sell, since unlike a new property, people know what they're getting into. Like, people know what Ghostbusters is, so with a movie like the recent Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, you don't have to put in a ton of effort to explain the concept to people, since it's based on a beloved property, using the same name and identical iconography to the original. The property speaks for itself. Yes, marketing is important, 
since you want people to actually know that the film exists and it can be a challenge to get younger audiences interested since they'll be less familiar, but nostalgia does most of the legwork. Saying that, Frozen Empire didn't do too great. It made just over $200 million global on a $100 million budget, but considering that marketing costs are roughly about a third of a film's budget, it barely broke even. The big budget movies that audiences have familiarity with have had a lot of successes, an obscene amount, but fatigue is setting in. The general public is getting bored with them, and last year we saw numerous movies released that studios probably safely assumed would bring in a cool billion. Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, which marks the beginning of Marvel's fifth phase of movies, had a disappointing box office return. It had a gigantic $326.6 million budget, but only brought in $476.1 million, and once again, if you factor in the marketing cost, that'll be a loss. The Marvels made a loss of $237 million, even though it featured Captain Marvel, who in her solo movie brought in a billion dollars. Warner Brothers The Flash lost $155 million, even though it was based on a recognizable property. Disney has had a streak of failures with their CG animated films, one of the worst being Wish, which lost $131 million, and Indiana Jones, a legacy franchise with millions of fans across multiple generations, lost $143 million with its latest sequel, The Dial of Destiny. These are all big name, big budget movies from studios with seemingly infinite production and marketing budgets, and although they pumped billions into these films, audiences ultimately responded with a resounding, who cares? I just want to add, and this is just me spitballing here, maybe part of the problem is because movie trailers these days are terrible. They don't properly communicate the plot, the kind of movie it is, or what makes it different from others. It's just all vibes. In fact, part of the problem is that trailers for big budget films feel far too similar to each other, and nothing stands out as a result. Maybe we should bring back the uh, inner world trailer guy, you know? What? He's dead. When? Alright. I'll do it. In a world where bees love jazz. You like jazz? <laughs> To me, the failure of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire and the new Indiana Jones might be a sign that people are finally becoming tired of nostalgic properties. In the past decade, we've been given endless amounts of revivals and reboots, and it's only natural that people will get tired of it. Nostalgia may be a drug, but like any other drug, you can build a tolerance to the point where it just doesn't do anything for you anymore. By the way, I did a video on nostalgia and why it's bad for you a while back. Check it out, it's one of my favorites, and that's saying something because I think my videos suck. That being said, please uh, support me on Patreon if you can because uh, I, I need to make a living off this and YouTube pays terribly, uh, so yeah, that stuff matters. Any amount you can offer, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. Movie studios don't like to think about it, but movie-going audiences genuinely do want new things, or at the very least, different things. The problem with that is that different things are considered a risk. It's harder to sell when you try to market something that doesn't have much or any pre-existing familiarity, but audiences do miss seeing things that are simply different to what else is being offered. Barbie may have been based on a popular toy franchise, but the movie itself was different and interesting, and ended up earning almost $1.5 in the box office. There was a caveat in that it was a rare instance in which the marketing budget was slightly larger than the production budget, but it paid off. Oppenheimer was successful because it had some pedigree to it, with Christopher Nolan being the director, and that's something you see less of these days. Movies that bring in audiences because of the director attached to it. Movies by Steven Spielberg used to be a big deal, but it's not like that anymore. Even legendary directors like Martin Scorsese have begun to release their films directly onto streaming services with financial backing from them because big movie studios don't want to put money into something that isn't going to pull in a billion dollars. The dominance of well-known franchises presents a dilemma for movie theaters. 
While theater operators, particularly those in smaller non-franchise establishments, may wish to diversify their offerings, they're constrained by audiences' demands. The general public tends to prioritize big budget, big studio produced films, leaving these theaters with little choice than to cater to this demand in order to remain viable. However, even this strategy may not be sufficient to ensure survival, as operating a movie theater entails significant financial expenses. Very quickly, hopefully, let's go over some costs. First and foremost, there's the building itself, which since theaters serve only one purpose, they have to be built from scratch, and they usually require land acquisition. Building or leasing a theater with multiple screens can cost on average up to $30,000 per month. There's the cost of staff, point of sale systems, utilities and inventory like snacks and cleaning equipment, all of which can vary in cost dramatically depending on the size of the operation. There's also insurance and legal services, the former being anything from $30,000 to $60,000 a year on average. The technology behind showing the actual movies is where the costs can really stack up though. Firstly, there's the media block, which converts the data from a studio into a movie. These can average at about 14,000 and be as high as 40,000. Theaters also need a server to store movies too, which will run you anywhere from $12,000 to $27,000. Then there's the screen, which can be as little as $3,000 for a basic 30-foot white matte screen or $12,000 for a silver premium large format screen or PLF. Installed new, it can cost as much as $50,000. Of course, you'll need a projector and a sound system as well. Theaters have started to switch over to laser projectors, which have benefits over other models. They're capable of higher image fidelity and brightness. They don't require expensive bulbs or intensive cooling, and they use 70% less electricity. They also have a lifespan of about 10 to 15 years. However, they are expensive prohibitively expensive. For a standard screen, they can cost about $40,000, and for a PLF screen, they can be as high as $150,000. Laser projectors also have different requirements to make them work, like repositioning the projection booth entirely, which can potentially mean that theaters have to remove an entire row of seats to accommodate it, and therefore sell less tickets for a showing. Lastly, for a Dolby Atmos sound system, you're looking at a $75,000 to $100,000 bill. I'm not even going to tally up all of the costs here, but if you want to have a theater with eight screens, which is generally considered the ideal number, you're looking at a few million in costs just to get started up. And that number can skyrocket if you have more elaborate technologies like IMAX or 4DX theaters. All of this is done to convince audiences that if you want the best experience when watching a movie, then the theater is the best place to go. There's a problem though, and it's not just the cost of a ticket or the theater quality. The problem is that regardless of how amazing and immersive the movie theater experience may be, not enough people care to make a difference and how a movie is experienced isn't too important to most people. You see, in the past, watching a movie in the theater was a much easier sell, and that was because the quality and affordability of home theater technology available to consumers was much, much worse than what we have now. Back in the 90s, most people would have something like a 25-inch full-screen format CRT TV in their living room. For audio, they'd use the built-in speaker, and if they wanted to watch a movie, they'd have to wait for it to air on TV, pay for premium channels on cable or satellite, or buy or rent a movie on VHS and later DVD. All of these were pretty damn expensive, and even if you dished out the cash for something fancier, it still wouldn't come anywhere close to the theater experience. The home viewing experience simply couldn't compete with the movie theater. Cut to present day though, and the cost to have a high quality movie viewing experience is insanely low by comparison. Take a look at this Best Buy flyer from 1998. If you wanted to buy a 36 inch Philips Magnavox full screen CRT TV with a $50 saving, it's $899.92, which in today's money is $1,733.97. 
Today, if you wanted to buy a 65-inch flat-screen television with 4K resolution, high dynamic range, and smart TV functionality, it is a paltry $399, which in 1998 would only be $207. And bear in mind, TVs go on sale all the time, so if you wait a little bit, you can probably get it cheaper than that. In fact, why not include a fairly cheap soundbar, like this $98 Sony one? It's not high-end, but it's way better quality than the TV speakers, and when you add it to the cost, it's still cheaper than the Philips Magnavox on its own. Obviously, this doesn't compare to the likes of watching a movie on a 50-foot screen with a huge sound system to accompany it, but for most people, myself included, it's more than enough. In fact, the TV in our living room is smaller than the one I just mentioned, and I'm fine watching Oppenheimer on it even if it would make Christopher Nolan cry himself to sleep if he heard that. It doesn't count if you watch my movies on a telly. Stop watching it on your phone. I made Batman. Some people, namely teens and young adults, are perfectly fine watching an entire movie on their phone while using the built-in speakers, which director David Lynch has some very strong opinions on. It's a, such a sadness that you think you've seen a film on your telephone. Get real. I can't say I'd like to do that myself, but it just goes to show. People care less and less about the way in which they watch a movie, and instead prioritize the cost and ease in which they can watch one. Younger generations as a whole are becoming less interested in watching movies and television. In a study conducted by Deloitte, nearly half of Gen Z respondents and a third of millennials prefer watching live streams and video content on sites like YouTube and TikTok, and only 24 and 27% of respondents respectively saying that they prefer new and old TV shows. Rather shockingly though, a meagre 11% of Gen Zs and 18% of Millennials said that they prefer new and old movies. The shift away from streaming services among Gen Zs and Millennials can be attributed to several factors. Social video sites, expanding selection of custom, brief and up-to-date content, and the free accessibility of the material are chief among these reasons. They also believe that streaming services aren't as good at providing tailored content as platforms like YouTube, and they're becoming too expensive, with more than 50% of both generations reporting cancelling a subscription in the last six months. With streaming services regularly raising their prices, this trend is likely to persist. Look at the option. Either travel a few miles to a building, pay $20 for a ticket, and hope that all the conditions are right for you to enjoy the movie which you may or may not like, or use the equipment that you already own in the comfort of your home to watch the same thing for a fairly cheap price. The more you think about it, the easier the choice becomes. It's like have you ever seen one of those pics of something like a Big Mac that's been deconstructed to look like a gourmet cuisine? The movie theatre experience has kind of become like that. It's nicer, and maybe it enhances it, but when you watch a movie at home, it's still the same product. Except now, the Big Mac looks like it did when you got it from the drive-thru. It's the same taste, just a different experience, and most people are fine with the taste alone. Movie studios are responsible for this though, where potential customers are fine staying at home to watch their movies. Before COVID-19, people had already become accustomed to watching movies at home either through streaming services like Netflix or digital rentals and purchases. The selection available to them was, and still is, gigantic. So even if you don't have a movie you want to watch in mind, it's easy enough to browse around and find one. When the pandemic started and people had to stay indoors and theatres around the world closed their doors, some permanently. Movie studios still had film releases lined up though, but with no big screens to put them on, they kept delaying the release dates for their tentpole blockbuster movies. But when it became apparent that the pandemic wasn't coming to an end anytime soon, they decided to swallow their pride and make them available to watch at home via streaming. One of the most notable cases was Disney's 2020 Mulan remake, which ended up having its plans for a theatrical run scrapped entirely in favour of releasing it on Disney Plus's premium service for an additional rental fee of $29.99 US. This might seem like a lot, and if you wanted to watch the movie solo, it is, but 
Consider the fact that Disney is all about family movies. So for that family of four that I mentioned earlier, it goes from being a $100 theater visit to only $30. Other studios did the same, and Warner Brothers even went so far as to release their movies on Max without any additional rental fees, which was kind of a mind-blowing move. Not everyone in the industry was happy with it, but you better believe audiences were. This was pretty much the turning point, and the audience's relationships with how they watch movies was forever transformed, and no amount of fancy theater technology could convince all these people to keep paying for tickets. Movie theaters have opened their doors again, but people, such as myself, are more than fine watching from their couch. Even if there's a movie that you want to watch that's only showing in theaters, but you don't want to pony up for a ticket, you don't have to wait very long to see it at home. Many releases go from the theater screens to your home screens within a matter of weeks. To give you a recent example, Dune 2 released in theaters on March 1st this year, and by April 16th it was available at home. If you're not a die-hard Dune fan, then a month and a half wait really is nothing. This is another thing that was different in the past. Big movies were given more time in the theater because that's how people wanted to watch them. Titanic, for example, was released on December 19th, 1997 in the US, and it stayed on screens until October 1998, almost an entire year. Could this be considered consumer unfriendly since it deprives them of viewing options? Sure, but the movie theater meant something back then. And it wasn't a case where you had movie studios dumping out one blockbuster after another throughout the entire year, oversaturating the market with homogenous, forgettable movies that feel as though they only exist to keep you entertained for two hours of your life until you find another one to occupy your time. Movies are important and have been pivotal in shaping our culture in both good ways and bad. But that's testament to their power. The remakes, reboots, and sequels that we see today are only possible because in the past, we saw movies as something far more valuable than what they are now. Theaters are a place where you would go, where you would sit in a room for a few hours, and what you saw there would leave an impression on you for the rest of your life, and that is a really beautiful thing. To movie studios, those precious memories have turned you, the audience, into a demographic so some of your cherished moments can be monetized in hopes that you can relive a joyous time in your life where reality didn't feel like a gauntlet of disappointments. I don't blame audiences for falling for it because I would like that too. And I've taken my fair share of weaponized nostalgia too. Nostalgia is losing its value though, and although movie studios have successfully gotten audiences to watch movies that are familiar to them over and over again, they're failing to capture the nostalgia of actually going to the movie theater, to go and see something that feels like it actually meant something. If movie studios just lightened up on their perverse need to make every movie earn a billion dollars and gave modest budgets to new ideas that actually intrigue people enough to get them out of their houses to go and see it at the cinema, then we'd all benefit. Given how we consume media nowadays, with it being an endless stream of content available to all of us at all times, I don't think it's possible for there to be any more classic films that span generations, but that doesn't mean that we need to be spoon-fed nostalgic properties that invoke the classics to make up for it. People want new and different ideas. Even if they don't realize it, they do. Any industry that hedges its bets almost exclusively on the expensive risk and tries to mitigate that risk by throwing even more money at it for marketing only has itself to blame when audiences eventually get tired of what they're offering. I don't know whether movie theaters need saving, outside of the historic ones. Maybe they're just becoming a relic of the past now that it's so cheap and easy to have a good movie viewing experience at home. I've always had a feeling that in time, movie theaters would end up becoming a place where they exclusively show blockbuster movies, and that has kind of come true. Now that that isn't enough anymore, I really don't know what comes next.
Maybe most of them end up shutting down, and the few that remain start charging hundreds of dollars for a ticket and market it as a premium experience for those privileged enough to be able to pay for it. Maybe they'll make tickets cheaper and hope that'll attract people, or let you drink directly from the butter dispenser if you buy a large popcorn with a ticket. Maybe they'll just disappear and end up becoming supermarkets. Maybe things are just different now. But different isn't always a bad thing. It's just different. Take care. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, sub, and all the other stuff that makes me die a little inside every time I ask for it. Thanks to all the people who support me at patreon.com slash Solari, and a shout out to the ones who donate $5 or more. Texas Lioness, Martin Chung, Femgirl Aaron, MD Bagel, JP, Minty, Malcontents, Jacob Mayer, Zoe B, Fishcatch, Mech, Beige Circle, Jonathan Morris, Aria Rose, Bailey Grevling, Catherine Pandel, Dan McCrary, Remy Allen, Lizzie Peasy, Grant B, Enrique Gutierrez, Murgurger Fashionable, Alina, R. Atoms, Sparrowwagon, The Deer Prince, El Salvador Dali, Syndrome Noir, Tadeo de Oria, Ryan Osterman, Jay, Cami, Catherine, Dio, Carlin, Patrick McBain, Gina I, Gay Fox Collective, Ruby O'Connor, David, Vertex, Emily Argentine, The Paltism, Haplo, Tanda, BestFriendsGang.tv, Locked In, Kev Yu, and Gertz Feinreich. Thank you all for your kind support. I stream on YouTube every week, I have a Discord, and uh, who am I kidding? No one stays around for this bit. Tell you what, if you did, leave a comment just saying something like Bingus McDingus, I, I don't know. That should be nice and confusing for everyone else. Anyway, bye.